a character study on David, and it's there's so much information, and there's so many ways you could go with that character study. We could we could pick him apart, <laughs> or you can look at the good things because I think whenever you look at the life of David, even though he made mistakes, he had issues. Uh, the Bible has very positive things to say about him. Whenever we think of David, we think of shepherd, poet. I remember as a kid thinking a giant killer, and that's what he was. He was a giant killer, a king. He's also the ancestor of Jesus. And in short, he is one of the greatest people in the Old Testament. But alongside that list stands another list of qualities, and that is a betrayer, a liar, an adulterer, a murderer. The first list of qualities we we all might like to have, the second qualities that might be true of any one of us, whether that's something that we would uh, make public or not. The Bible makes no effort in hiding David's sins and his issues, his failures, but he's remembered and respected for his heart for God. And knowing how much more we share in David's failures than in his greatness is we should be curious to find out what made God refer to David as a man after his own heart. That's him being anointed. Um, I just thought, do some pictures, because I know some of our kids like pictures, and I kept it PG. Um, why don't we look at this verse, and then we'll uh, go to God in order to prayer. <clears throat> but in the book of Acts, chapter 13, Paul's preaching to the church there at Antioch, or the people at Antioch in a synagogue there, and he says, after that, he gave them judges for about 450 years until Samuel, the prophet. And afterward, they asked for a king. So God gave them Saul, the son of Kish, a man of the tribe of Benjamin for 40 years. And this is a part of history we've already covered in this Old Testament study. Verse 22, and when he had removed him, he raised up for him David as king, to whom also he gave testimony and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart who will do all my will from this man's seed, according to the promise God raised up for Israel, a savior, Jesus. And this afternoon, I'd like to look at four characteristics of David. We're also going to look at some bad too, but these are positive characteristics of David. And then hopefully draw our comments from there. So the first characteristic I'd like to look at this evening with David is David was a faithful defender. In uh, 1 Samuel chapter 17, you could turn there if you want, story we're all very familiar with. David is a teenager and still living at home. He's tending sheep for his, his father. David's three brothers are soldiers in Saul's army. And at this time, a, a war has broke out between the Philistines and Israel in the valley of Elah. And David's job on this particular day was to take supplies to his brothers on the front line. When he arrives at the battlefield, he's just in time to see the star of the show. And that star of the show is Goliath, and Goliath is quite a person, as you can, uh, you can read about it. He was about nine and a half feet tall. That's a big boy. Nine and a half feet tall. And he'd been doing war his whole life. That's what he knew. His armor that he carried was about 125 pounds. I can't imagine that, carrying 125 pounds around you. His spearhead was 15 pounds. That's the head of it. That's not counting the wood or metal it takes to carry that, that dude around. He was, a, he was a tank on two legs. And he also had an armor bearer. And uh, Israel was scared to death of this fella. Because what had happened is, usually in war... That, you know, what we're used to is two opposing armies come in and they meet in the middle and they just beat each other apart. And eventually enough people are dead that these other people win. They don't want to do that on this particular occasion. They said, we'll take our best guy. You take your best guy. Whoever wins, you come home with them. Easy. Not a lot of people die that way. But Israel was yet to, fill, to take a man on the field to go against Goliath. And if you remember Saul, Saul was, whenever we compare big people, there's always somebody bigger. Remember, Saul was a head taller than everybody else in Israel. So Saul's a big fella. Saul's probably the biggest guy on the battlefield for Israel, but he's not going to go out and face Goliath. 
They're just sitting there. And this big man keeps coming out every day and taunting the children of Israel, taunting God. And these people are just taking it. Well, David shows up. And in verse uh, chapter 17, verse 34 through 37... If you want to turn there, we'll we'll read that. But David eventually convinces Saul that I'll go out on the battlefield. A little kid, I'd say he's a teenager, but he's still, you got men that are battle arrayed and they know what they're doing. And you got this kid and he says, I'll go out there and face that dude. And he convinces him in verse 34, it says, but David said to Saul, your servant used to keep his father's sheep. And when a lion or bear came and took a lamb out of the flock, I went out after it and I struck it and delivered the lamb from its mouth. And when it arose against me, it caught it by its beard and struck and killed it. Your servant has killed both lion and bear and this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, seeing his defied the armies of the living living God. Moreover, David said, the Lord who delivered me from the paw of the lion and from the paw of the bear, he will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. David was a defender of God's people. But how, you might ask, because he was a youth. He was a youth. And the difference in David and everyone else on the field is that David was fully aware that God was in control of his life. Fully aware of that. And he had faith that God would deliver him from impending danger. How else would anyone in the world venture into something like that? Do you want to fight a nine and a half foot guy? No, I don't. I'd hit him in the knees. Because that's all I can reach. But David knew early in his life that God was to be trusted and obeyed. And as we see in Scripture, David's faith pleased God, and God rewarded David for his faithfulness. And his reply, even whenever he he went out to face Goliath, if you go down to verse 45 through 47, you know, Goliath's taunting him too. I mean, put put the shoe on the other foot. Imagine being the nine and a half foot guy, and you go, well, I'll take the best you got, and they send a little kid out there with some rocks and a sling. Isn't that going to hurt your feelings? Yeah. You need to get this kid out of here. But yeah, he's out there taunting him. But listen to what David tells him. It says, Then David said to the Philistine, You come to me with a sword and with your spear and with a javelin, but I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. This day the Lord will deliver you into my hand, and I will strike you and take your head from you. And this day I will give the carcasses of the camp of the Philistines to the birds of the air and the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. Then all the assembly shall know that the Lord does not save with sword and spear, for the battle is the Lord's, and he will give you into our hands. David was a defender. He was a defender of Israel. And you, you'll see even if you read the story of David, you'll see even when he was a king, David, you know, he went out to battle every year. Except that one. He went out to battle and he defended Israel. Secondly, sorry, I was supposed to show you that. All right. So we see that he was a defender. Secondly, David sought to unite his people spiritually. Whenever David became king, the ark there was... It wasn't in Jerusalem. And David said, we're bringing that thing home. We're bringing that ark to Jerusalem. And this is another reason that David was a man after God's own heart, is that he absolutely loved God's law, and he wanted his people to love God as well. You don't see that out of a lot of of leaders, worldly leaders especially. They want you to trust in them, but David wanted them to trust, trust in the Lord. You know, of the 150 Psalms in the Bible, David is credited for writing over half of them, writing at various and often troubling times in his life. David repeatedly mentioned how much he loved God's perfect word. And we find a beautiful example in Psalms 119, verse 47 and 48. Uh, The Bible says, And I will delight myself in your commandments, which I love. My hands also I will lift up to your commands, commandments, which I love, and I will meditate on your statutes. David was bothered by the fact that he lived in a house of cedar, but the ark dwelled in a tent. That bothered him. Now, how many people would that bother? Apparently, it didn't bother anybody else in Israel. 
but it bothered David. And he wanted to build the Lord a house or a, a dwelling place to, to put the ark, but he was not allowed to build that because he was a man of war. But David prepared his son Solomon for that. By the time that David had passed away, he'd acquired gold, silver, and all precious metals. He'd already been cutting wood. He was ready to get that thing built, and he was preparing his son. But it's not hard to see that his complete adoration for God's word, that's what he had an adoration for God's word. And sometimes we struggle to pick it up and to read it on a daily basis, but he was, he was just, he was wanting to be as close as possible. Notice how David, David meditates on God's statutes. God granted David to not only read God's word, but also to, to think about it throughout the day. In Psalms chapter 119, verses two and three, blessed are those who keep his testimony, who seek him with the whole heart. They also do no iniquity. They walk in his ways. So we can see that David loved the Lord and David wanted to unite his people spiritually. And that's the second um, thing that I want to, to put in our minds this afternoon. The third thing is David was an extender of, of grace. There was many occasions, but I chose three. Uh, the first two examples, David spared the life of King Saul on two occasions. And if, if you don't know the story of David, you would say, well, so what? Well, Saul tried to kill David and he kept him on a run pretty often because he wanted David dead. And on these two particular occasions, uh, turn to 1 Samuel chapter 26. But on the, the first occasion, um, David spared the life of King Saul uh, he, uh, Saul was attending to his needs in a cave. David and uh, his folks were in there, in that same cave. And uh, he had the opportunity to kill Saul then, but he didn't. And then in um, what we're going to read here, uh, David has actually snuck into the camp. And Saul's out there sleeping. He's got a spear stuck by his side. And the Bible says, Then Abishah said to David, God has delivered your enemy into your hand this day. Now, therefore, please let me strike him at once with a spear right to the earth, and I will not have to strike him a second time. But David said to Abishah, Do not destroy him, for who can stretch out his hand against the Lord's anointed and be guiltless? David said, Furthermore, as the Lord lives, the Lord shall strike him, or his day shall come to die, or he shall go out to battle and perish. Whenever most people would have took that opportunity, if a guy's hunting you, well, if you can hunt him and get that over with, that seems a lot easier, doesn't it? You don't have to run no more. Spared him two times. The next example I'd like to look at, that's my first two. The next one's Mephibosheth. That's a different name. You might have read this story, but maybe you haven't. Uh, in 2 Samuel chapter 9, Verses 1 through 3. It said, Now David said, Is there anyone who is left in the house of Saul that I may show my kindness for Jonathan's sake? And there was a servant of the house of Saul whose name was Ziba. So when they had called him to David, the king said to him, Are you Ziba? And he said, At your service. Then the king said, Is there not still someone of the house of Saul to whom I may show the kindness? Of God. And when you read these verses, you might ask, well, why would he ask this? Because, you know, David had made a covenant with Jonathan. And that Jonathan would, is, would have been Saul's son. And Jonathan and David were very close friends. And, and their, their uh, pact or covenant was that they wouldn't kill each other's descendants. And that's in, you don't have to turn there, but that's in 1 Samuel chapter 20, verses 15 and 16, if you're taking notes. But, you know, the usual outcome for a surviving family whenever a dynasty changes, when you get a new king, you kill all the other people because that makes sense. You don't want anybody coming in and trying to take over again, so you just get rid of them. That's usually what happens. And I'm sure that whenever um, Mephibosheth found that somebody was looking for him, probably freaked him out a little bit. But that's not at all why David was wanting Mephibosheth. David has a different thought in his mind, and it's kindness. David's servant says that one of Jonathan's sons is alive. He's living over there in, in Lodabar. And Lodabar means barren land. 
That's where you go where nobody wants to kill you because they don't want to go there. And so he's living in Lodabar. Um, Mephibosheth is also, um, he's crippled. He's crippled because whenever his nurse found out that Jonathan and Saul had died in battle, they flee because they know that they stay around, they're gone. So they flee, and during that fleeing process, Mephibosheth was dropped, I believe he was five, and it, it broke his legs, or it, it mangled him in such a fashion to where he was not, uh, walking wasn't what he was good at. But he's been living in a desolate place, he's in really bad shape, But David blessed Mephibosheth, sorry, I have trouble with that name, Mephibosheth, uh, abundantly. First of all, whenever he, uh, he finally got to see Mephibosheth, he returned all of his ancestral lands to him. He gave him back all the family lands. But the highest honor that he gave Mephibosheth is that he would eat at the king's table continually. One of Saul's family eating at his table, eating at the king's table continuously. That doesn't mean you come over for dinner once a week. That means you're there. That's your spot. And that's very interesting. It, it to me shows that David shows grace. And David's kindness to Mephibosheth foreshadows God's amazing grace to us. And I, I didn't even think about this until I read Doug Edwards' book. So I'm just going to give you the, the uh, four points that he has. And I'll let you think about that. But um, God's amazing grace is available to all of humanity through Jesus Christ, and we know that. But there are several points of similarity in this story. First of all, David searched for a descendant of Saul to bless, just as God searched for us by sending his son Jesus to save us from our sins. That's number one. Secondly, Mephibosheth lived in a desolate, lonely place while we previously lived in a sin separated from God. Thirdly, as Mephibosheth Mephibosheth acknowledged his unworthiness. He called himself a dead dog whenever he met uh, King David. We also acknowledge our unworthiness before God. And fourthly, Mephibosheth was rewarded for Jonathan's sake and not his own good deeds. We're saved because of Christ's death and not our own good works. And I thought that was very interesting what um, Doug had brought up in those passages. But we can see that, that David was a man who extended grace uh, to those around him and those that, that should have been his enemies. But he extended grace to them. Our fourth point this evening. I found that to be an interesting picture. Ooh, I see your face. <clears throat> this is the threshing floor of Arana. I don't know if I said that right, but I, I really acted like I did, didn't I? Arana. But... Um, this is an interesting story that in the end of it, David pretty much volunteers for punishment for all of this. I guess I should start reading it to you and then maybe you can, we'll draw conclusions from there. But in 2 Samuel 24, David has decided that he wants to number his people. He wants to number his people. He wants to take a census. We're used to that. We do that every 10 years in this country, I believe. Maybe, uh, maybe this was out of pride. Look at, all the, look at all the people and all the army I have. Maybe it was because he was placing, David was placing more trust in uh, his army and his ability than he was relying on God. Either way, whenever he took this census, that made God angry. And Another thing I find interesting in this story, Joab, if you've read story uh, through David's life, Joab, Joab is a murderer. If you want somebody killed, Joab's your guy. But if you want to go talk some Bible, Joab, not your guy. And Joab, whenever David said, I want to do a census, Joab's like, that's not a good idea. Now, when that guy tells you that, you should probably listen. But he didn't. He went ahead and took his census. But, but here's what comes of this. Um, David took the census. This displeased the Lord. So God was going to punish him. And he said, you got three choices, David. Number one, seven years of famine. Option one. Option two, three months of fleeing from your enemies. Option three, three days of plague throughout the land. Now, I'm going to take the same one that David took. 
Because I'd rather do three days and three months and seven years. Three days, get it done with, pull the Band-Aid off. That's what David did. David said, we'll take, we'll, take, we'll take the plague. Give that to us. So David chose option three. The Lord sent a plague and it killed 70,000 men in Israel. 70,000 people died because some guy wanted to, to take a census. Okay? That's a, that's a real deal there. 70,000 people. And when the angel of the Lord causing this plague reached the threshing, threshing floor of Aranah, see, I said that right again, Aranah, God gracious, graciously stopped the plague. Just stopped it. And then the prophet Gad told David, you need to offer something now to please the Lord. And where are we at? We're at the threshing floor of Anna. And 2 Samuel 24 uh, seven, in verse 17, Then David spoke to the Lord when he saw the angel who was striking the people and said, Surely I have sinned and I have done wicked, but these sheep, what have they done? Let your hand, I pray, be against me and against my father's house. So David wants to take all this on himself. Yes, he caused it. I agree with that. But how many people are going to raise your hand and say, I'll take all of it? Nobody. And David says, I'm guilty. I'm liable. Take me. God wasn't going to take him. But Gad told David, you need to build an altar. Uh, Arana offered to give David his threshing floor. He offered, he said, you just take it. Take it, offer it, do whatever you want. And this is the verse that we usually take. This is the verse we've heard. Um, it says, then, then the king said to Arana, no, but I will surely buy it from you for a price nor will I offer burnt offerings to the Lord my God with, with which cost me nothing. So he does have an opportunity to make the sacrifice, and he can do that. But he says, I'm going to buy it. Because if I'm not losing anything out of this deal, what am I doing? And I think sometimes, man, that needs to be my attitude. Because I look at how it in, something might inconvenience me. That matters not. Well, what matters is what I'm doing for the Lord. And I believe David saw that. So David purchased and he made the offering. And yes, David caused this mess, but how many people would just volunteer to take punishment? Now we've looked at David's good qualities, but um, for a moment I want to look at some negative stuff because I know most people are thinking, well, what about the elephant in the room? Yeah, okay, well, we'll talk about that for just a moment. You know, the question might be asked, how was it that David sinned so badly at times, but yet he was still called a man after God's own heart? And you might have had that question too, because when you look at David's life, there are great things that happen. You know, David was a portrait of success and failures, and the biblical record does not hide that. And I appreciate that very much, because David wasn't perfect. And usually when he, he made mistakes as king, everyone suffered. It wasn't just him. Everybody suffered. When the king gets punished, everybody's punished, right? Yeah. Uh, turmoil at times. David's house was divided. You know, one of David's um, sons raped his daughter. Wow. That's getting crazy. And you know what David did about it? Nothing. He did nothing. You know who did something about it? His other son, Absalom. Guess what he did? He killed that guy. So David's house was in uh, disarray. I guess you'd call it dysfunctional is what we call it in today's society. Uh, Absalom even tried to take the fr throne from David. Th these are not great things about David, but still, all of us have got our baggage. All of us have got the bad things about us. Remember our list from earlier. He was a liar. He was an adulterer. He was a murderer. And there are consequences to these actions. And David faced those consequences, and most people that were around David had to face those consequences. But what made David a cut above the rest was that his heart was pointed toward God. He had a deep desire to follow God's will and to do everything God wanted him to do. He was a man after God's own heart. After his sin with Bathsheba in 2 Samuel chapter 11, um, chapter 11, verse 2 through 5, uh, he was repentant. You know, mighty men fall very hard. And David fell, David's fall included adultery, lying, uh, the murder of Uriah. This wasn't just like killing some one soldier in your army. Uriah, from what I understand, was part of the 30. He's the dirty 30. He's the guy. 
So that's somebody that he knew very well. And because of his mistake, he said, you're going to have to get him killed. Wow. Now you're killing your friends, not just some soldier. But whenever David was confronted by Nathan, when Nathan tells this, tells this uh, great story, and David falls for it hook, line, and sinker, um, David admits, you know, I've sinned against God. And in uh, 2 Samuel chapter 12, verse 13, it says, David said to Nathan, I have sinned against the Lord. And Nathan said to David, the Lord also has put your sin away. You shall not die. But admitting our sin and asking for forgiveness is only half of the equation. The other half is repentance. And David did that as well. Whenever we look in the book of Psalms in chapter 51, verses 1 and 2, that's David's prayer of repentance to God. And in that, in that verse, he says, Have mercy on me, O God, according to your steadfast love, according to your abundant mercy, blot out my transgressions, wash me thoroughly from my iniquity, and cleanse me from my sin. Cleanse me from my sin. And I believe the lesson that we can learn for this, because sometimes we think whenever somebody sins, well, if they do this, this sin, well, that's, that's terrible. I don't know if you can... No, stop. The point is, is when we sin, we fix it. We repent, okay? Very simple, we repent. Whenever, whenever David was found out, he repented. Yeah, he hit it and hit it and hit it. Guess what? We've done it too. We've hit things and hit things and hit things. But whenever you're confronted with it, you fix it. You fix it and you move on. That's what we see in the life of David. You stop denying and you seek repentance no matter what you did. And David's life was marked by seasons of great peace and prosperity, as well as times of fear and despair. But through all the seasons in his life, he never forgot to thank the Lord for everything that he had. Everything that he had. And it's truly one of David's finest characteristics. In uh, Psalms 100 verse 4, it says, Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him. Bless his name. And as followers of Jesus Christ, we would do well to follow David's lead of offering praise through thanksgiving uh, to our Lord. And as you... As you're reading about the life of David and you see that his time's coming, his curtain's falling, the end of life is there, his influence through the covenant that God made with him is keeps going on and on and on. It's felt for eternity. David's seed who will rule over God's kingdom will play a prominent role in the rest of the Old Testament throughout the entirety of the New Testament. And I um, believe Nathan taught on the Davidic uh, covenant and did a very good job I haven't listened to it yet so there's i'm giving it to you before that but in conclusion this afternoon david was a man after god's own heart because he demonstrated his faith and was committed to following the lord yes his faith was tested on a grand scale yes he failed several occasions very badly but after his sin he sought and received the lord's forgiveness and in the final analysis david loved God's law, and sought to follow it exactly. He also set Solomon up for success in preparing him to build the temple. And as a man after God's own heart, David is a role model for us. He's a role model for us. And there's many things that I believe that we can learn from the life of David. I think we all need to be defenders of the truth, don't we? And I think um, what is interesting about the story of Goliath and David is you got a youth a youth. We always wonder, how do I make a difference? It doesn't matter how old you are, folks, because everybody else wants to go along with the crowd. You just be the guy or girl that stands up and says, no, I'm not doing it, and this is why I'm not doing it. We don't have to falter every time temptation shows up. How about being the big person? Be that guy or be that girl. But so much we can learn from the story of David. I appreciate your attention this evening. I know that uh, this service is difficult because I got a full belly and so do you. But uh, I hope that something said is useful to you. I hope that we can uh, take the char good characteristics of David and, and make application in our life where we can and be defenders of the Lord and want to uh, spiritually uplift God's people. Thanks for watching this video. I know what you're thinking. I don't want to miss another video from this channel. In order to avoid that, 
click on the red button down there, subscribe, and then click the bell icon. Not only will that alert you each time a new video is uploaded to the channel, it will also help spread the channel to other people's awareness. So go ahead, do it, like right now, click on it.